Hi everyone, welcome to lecture two where we talk about the strategic thinking and strategic decision making. Sounds like a mouthful, but basically if you want to think about how this course progresses and how your assignments progresses, progresses rather, it's explained in this diagram here which is figure 2.1 of your text. And what we're going to focus on today is the organisational mission and vision and how that then um, determines business definition and scope. And I suppose it's the old saying, you can please some of the people uh, some of the time, but you can't please all of the people all of the time. So business needs, or, or any organisation, needs to know where it sits, uh, what it's for, before we can commence the process of planning. So in terms of marketing's role in the organisation, you can see that it, it has these days quite a broad role. In uh, the corporate level of planning, so you'll see this on... Um, uh, for example, business reports where they talk about organic growth. Uh, so the overall corporate areas, which areas are we going to focus on? Then we can go down to a business unit. So for example, Virgin has airlines, trains, credit cards, uh, even cola drinks. So there's business unit planning there. And then we can go further down to product or even brand management planning as well. And so, corp so you can see that marketing is involved in all these aspects of planning mainly because it takes an external focus. Here are some examples of corporate mission statements past and present. Daimaru, who are a Japanese retailer, simply say, we sell service. And really what this is saying is this is positioning this retailer in terms not of pricing, in terms of not of range, but in terms of the service they provide. Toyota Lexus, when it was developed, I really like this one here, redefining customer expectations of a luxury marketplace, rewrite industry perceptions of value for money, and provide a benchmark for the manufacturing and servicing of all Toyota vehicles. So that's a really nice mission from which you can see a series of marketing strategies are um, being derived from that. From corporate strategies, we then move down to what we call marketing objectives. And this is really a statement of what is to be accomplished through activities that we do. Uh, for these to be meaningful and to provide conversion strengths to weaknesses, they should be in clear, simple terms. We should be able to measure them. So merely saying increasing awareness is not enough, you have to say at what level. Um, reducing customer churn is not enough, you have to say at what level. Um, getting a higher margin for your products, you have to say at what level. It should specify a time for accomplishment. These are normally a year. And it should be consistent with the business unit and corporate strategy. In terms of what we look for in an effective marketing strategy, it's shown here that we know what market we're in, that there's a, a skillful match between corporate strengths and the needs of the market. So we don't compete in markets where, even though they might be attractive, where we haven't developed capabilities in that market. We need to provide superior performance relative to the competition, and this is a key uh, success factor for any business or any organisation. Uh, this diagram here, which I've gleaned from another text, the Jane text, gives you an idea of where um, strategy sits within the wider context of, of things we do. So organisation strategies now have to react to the political legal environment, changes in technology, the economic environment, recession, um, economic upturn. Uh, one of the economic environments facing Australia currently is the lack of wage growth. And so consumers are very concerned social environment. And then we've got the three aspects of the triangle, which is our obviously our customers, but what we do in the corporation and our competition. And marketing strategy really sits in the middle there. However, um, marketing in the corporate environment is probably in recent years has been uh, declining. And we should all be realistic of that because some of you are soon going to be in that environment. One of the issues is that there is a lack of emphasis of marketing in the boardroom. Uh, boards really manage uh, risks in many major corporations and marketing, unless it is seen as a risk, now losing customers is a risk, having a greater churn is a risk, but it's not translated into financial risks. So that's an, another problem. Uh, there is a perception that marketing is about spending and not investment. So for example, if we can reduce churn, we actually reduce our costs. Um, also, investments, if we can have good, well-known brands, that can help us build up higher margins for our products and services. 
issues over which marketing had, um, uh, I suppose, importance, things like uh, big data, database marketing, um, even the research function have shifted towards other functions. Um, internal marketing has shifted towards HR and strategic HR as well. So these are uh, um, some of the issues that, that uh, confront marketers now. The chief marketing officer is seen in many organisations as less important as the CFO. And if you look at who um, is recently appointed to be uh, the head of major organisations, they tend to become from the CFO area. I came across this when I was talking to the colleagues at Mars about in being involved in Albury Wodonga. Uh, they're a food company here in Australia and worldwide. And the important people I spoke to was not the marketing people, but the CFOs. And this is because these people often will talk directly to boards and directly to uh, things like shareholder performance and so on. The attrition rate for CMOs is also quite high. Uh, so there's a lot of turnover there. They don't last more than about uh, two years. So really, um, there should be a closer role between marketing and finance. And uh, researchers who've studied the, the link between share market performance and marketing have come to this conclusion that the role of marketing expenditure should be to increase the value of the firm, the financial value. It's also important to remember, if the CEO has a background in marketing, marketing has a more strategic influence. So uh, Thoey, who's the head of Telstra, has a background in marketing, and what you're starting to see there is a more strategic influence in marketing. Only around 17% of Australian CEOs have a background in marketing. Most have a background in production, manufacturing, operations, or finance. And so the, this explains some of the difficulties that you'll face in your career. And really, there is almost another marketing campaign that you run, which is really trying to get impact into the boardroom of what you're doing. Now, there is uh, the famous three C's checklist, which uh, I think comes from McKinsey, over what makes a good marketing strategy. So if you're, very, if you're asked a job interview, what is it that you need to, to, to look for? These are the three aspects, where to compete, so what's the market, the entire market or one or more segments? How to compete? Are you going to do it by innovation? Are you going to do it by greater customer service, repeat business? Are you going to do it by loyalty schemes? When to compete? Timing of market entry, being first to gain first mover advantage or waiting until primary demand is being established, negating the need for expenditure on research and development is also an important consideration. And we saw that in the first lecture. Now let's have a look at an example here of Nintendo's success. And Nintendo's success in recent times was, was they didn't compete in everywhere in the computer game market or video game market, but they defined their market in a specific way. Uh, the, how do they compete? They were one of the first uh, organisations to, with the N Nintendo Wii, to look at the idea of human movement and also to involve games of more than one person. When to compete? The timing of market entry. They were the first in this area. Okay? Other organisations like Sony and, of course, um, Microsoft with the Xbox followed later. So let's have a look at how this all comes together uh, in some of their in the launch of the Wii advertisement in 2006 and see if you can see from this how they've defined their market, when they've competed and the timing of what they're doing.
Yeah, so I guess what you're seeing there also is the the changes in the way we promote things these days. By not, you know, it used to be the thirty second uh, advertisement. Now we can use a, a five minute advertisement on uh, a YouTube channel to promote a new service. Perhaps what you uh, let's have a look at the next slide and quickly uh, here. Here we go. Oops, sorry about that. There we go. How does the Nintendo position themselves in the video, and and how does it set them up for the battle against Sony, and how does Sony compete now? What did you notice? Were all the people the same? Were they playing one type of game? Were they playing individually or were they playing in groups? I think this is often a way that we might have a look at how they set themselves up uh, to position themselves in the market. It's not just a game platform, is it? It's also the games and it's also the type of games. How does Sony compete now? Well, of course, Sony has to, to a certain extent come up with the Move, iMove, uh, it's not iMove, but Move, um, application against it. Sony of course um, uh, through its Blu-ray Blu player um, also has, has tried to compete by making that the industry standard for video games moving forward. And of course that's changing now because many games are played online aren't they? So some aspects of strategic marketing. Well is there was an emphasis you saw in that advertisement that, that, that Nintendo took a long-term a long-term approach and there are long-term implications of that. It sort of changed the market st structure. You need corporate inputs from various aspects here. Obviously Nintendo would have had inputs from game designers, uh, from, their, from other people in their corporate networks, uh, from finance and so on. There are varying roles for different products and markets and you saw that in that uh, advertisement. And um, also there might be um, changes at the organisation levels, changes in hiring of particular people, changes in financial requirements and so on. So the relationship to finance is a key aspect of strategic marketing. Not only must you be able to budget, but you should be able to show how the actions will increase revenues and the value of the firm. Here's a, an example from the past. You probably don't remember this advertisement. And there's a reason for that. This is a, a post who were a competitor for Kellogg's uh, during uh, uh, the US Depression. Now, in the Depression, most people uh, cut back advertising. Kellogg's um, decreased expenditure, why Kell sorry, post decrease, why Kellogg's doubled its advertising budget. In the middle of the, of the Depression though, Kellogg's profit increased by 30%. So often, being, um, if you like, uh, for, following a contrarian point of view, or, or taking a competitive advantage can have long-term advantages. And we all know that Kellogg's is around, but probably, probably none of you have heard of Post. So the other emphasis on long-term implications goes back to the 1980s with uh, Goodyear. And uh, many tyre companies uh, decreased their focus on tyres. Goodyear, for example, focused more on that market. And now they're the number one tyre maker in several markets. And there are some examples down there. So some of the important corporate inputs, the culture that you have in the organisation, whims, fancies, traits, taboos, and rituals of top management um, are intrinsic to how a culture will be accepted. The various stakeholders, be they shareholders, um, government, um, will also have a role in the organisation. The resources that you have, the human, physical, uh, technological, technological assets, then we might look at things like capabilities such as brand rep reputation and so on. They will also determine the type of um, organisation or strategy you have. So in your assignment, which you're doing for um, a rebrand a re or a repositioning re of, a, of a corporate strategy, you need to take these things into account. Here's an example of the mission, vision, and I suppose approach that an organization, in this case Billabong, um, took with, with an acquisition when they bought Von Zipper, who were a maker of snow goggles and sunglasses in the United States. And you can see here the fit between the two cultures. We liked that it was new, young and edgy, and they were and there was not much baggage with it. The team they have in place was good. We're not going to turn it into a big company overnight. The intention is to maintain the brand's integrity market it on a global basis and have fun with it. So this is a corporate culture, I suppose, of being consultative, of uh, being dynamic, um, as you said, fun. 
And so I suppose this points to the continued success of Billabong in these markets. And Billabong is a surfwear maker, yet they can see uh, the um, advantages of moving into this part of the market as well, into a different market, I suppose. So I guess there's quite a, th quite a bit for you to th think about. There's more in your text textbook and online topics for information. So have a look at that or please feel free to contact me if there's anything to, I mentioned today that you're unsure of. Thanks for your time.